been waiting. We've been waiting. And anticipating. And anticipating. For the fire. For the fire. To fall on me. To fall. Let it burn. 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 Let it
I'll throw all the war horses into a crazed panic and their riders along with them. But I'll keep my eye on Judah, watching out for her at the same time that I will make the enemy horses go blind. <clears throat> uh, the families of Judah will then realize why our leaders are strong and able through God of the angel armies, their personal God. Amen. So even as we are seeing the whole uh, unfold before our eyes, even the situation that's happening in Israel, um, it is still all prophetic. Um, but the Bible says there's a promise that's given because Jerusalem is the city of the Lord. And even as um, we pray for the Bible declares in Psalm 122 that we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And um, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, one, because the Lord said to do it. Um, and he said that when you pray for Jerusalem, you prosper. The other reason is because there are prophetic promises that God has decreed and declared for Jerusalem. So we don't pray from a posture of things that's happening, um, but we pray prophetically in alignment to the word and the will of God. Amen. There are great things on the horizon. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight, and we praise you. <clears throat> thank you that as we gather around this medium of technology, Lord, thank you, Lord, that we have um, ordained, we have um, declared, Lord God, and set aside this technology, Lord, for the purpose of bringing you glory and honor, for declaring the greatness of your name, Lord, for sharing, Lord God, those wonderful things that you have done, uh, Father, and even the declaration of your word that brings light Lord, and gives life. And so we thank you, Lord. You said that wherever you find your name recorded, that you will come and bless it. And so, Father, we record your name, the name of Jesus, the strong name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus that every knee uh, must bow to, and the name that every tongue must confess and declare that Jesus is Lord. And so, Father, we thank you that even as we uh, continue, Lord, to lift Israel in our prayers, thank you <clears throat> that you said when we that we are to pray for Israel pay pray uh, for a uh, peace to be within their walls and prosperity <clears throat> within their gates and so Lord we declare your word even prophetically Lord we declare Lord uh your that peace be within their walls Lord that you are the peacemaker the king of peace that makes peace Lord I thank you Lord that you are the God father who will, who has blessed it, Jerusalem Lord and Israel you called it your holy city Lord and thank you that you will defend Lord the righteous and so we thank you that in the midst of this we come into agreement Lord with you and father we declare the name of Jesus Lord God um, uh, over Israel Lord we declare the name of Jesus Lord even in the global community father we thank you for this time as we gather together we pray, Father, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that you would uh, give us uh, insight, give us uh, wisdom, revelation, and knowledge into your word. We pray for our instructor tonight that you would bless her, Lord, um, as she begins to share what you have put in her heart to do. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that in all is said and done, that, Father, you be glorified and honored and lifted up and exalted. To you be the glory, the praise, the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. <clears throat> uh, so tonight uh, we are going to begin um, our class and um, our instructor tonight um, and for the next week, the Lord say the same, um, is uh, Elder Cheney Fabius. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the class over to her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Apostle. Um, hallelujah. Good evening, KDMI. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Happy Tuesday to everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone on Zoom. And I am moving forward, but just reflecting on, on the prayer that Apostle just prayed um, and the words that he spoke, but still moving forward uh, with tonight's lesson. And just thanking God for his goodness, thanking God for his mercy, thanking God that he is the alpha and the omega, thanking God that he is the beginning and the ending, that he knows all things, he sees all things, right? That he's the creator of time, that he's bigger than anything that we see on the news, that anything that, that we see in the media, that he's bigger than anything that occurs. And as Apostle said, that all of this is prophetic. 
that it's already been written, that he already knows that is going on. And so tonight we are going to be, or I'm gonna be teaching from the topic, keep on moving, don't look back. Keep on moving, don't look back. And so as we continue to move forward in this season, the Lord has been bringing the story of Lot's wife to my mind for a few weeks. Maybe for me, hopefully for somebody else too. But the Lord has been bringing the story of Lot's wife to my mind for a few weeks. And so as believers, we are overcomers. Many of us or we, we all believe what, what God says about us, but a lot of us um, or some of us still deal with um, wanting, with comparing and contrasting. We fall into the trap oftentimes of comparing and contrasting without ill intentions, but still comparing what was to what is and comparing what was to what is to come. So reminiscing over situations that seem better uh, where the conditions seem better than the challenges that lie ahead of us. And that's a little different than just reflecting, right, on lessons learned and things like that, but actually saying, you know, these, I, was, I was more comfortable in this situation until I, you know, decided to obey God, and now I'm faced with all these challenges. And so as an example, when we first moved here, I was having a really hard time getting adjusted to words before we joined the church. And I would say things like, I should have just stayed where I was. Literally words that came out of my mouth. It was easier. I wasn't away from my family. My job was easier. And to be clear, that would have been a horrible decision. And I knew it when I said it. That was not a good, would not have been a good idea for me to stay where I was. Because the Lord brought, started to, to, to remind me, but you didn't, have, you didn't have no money. So that was the first thing. So you could have stayed where you were, but you didn't have you had very bare, bare minimum resources. There was, there, there were things that just were, were not jiving where we were, where we were uh, at the time or prior to moving here. And so he's like, you, you forgetting all this stuff that you prayed your way out of. And here you are, and you're saying, I want to go back. And so um, it's just funny how we remember the good parts of past experiences that we actually prayed to get out of. It's like, you forgot what the actual situation was, right? You forgot that you prayed, I, I need a new job. You forgot that you prayed on all these different things. And so um, when we face what is unknown or what appears to be unchartered uh, territory, a lot of times our flesh will have us desire what we know, even if it wasn't the best situation. And so tonight we're and, and for the next week or so, we're going to be focusing mainly on um, Genesis 19, but I really encourage everyone to go back and study the earlier chapters because we're going to talk as we talk about Lot and his family. And so I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 26. Genesis 19, verses 12 through 26. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? And I believe this is the New King James Version. Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who, who had married his daughters and said, get up get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful, merciful, excuse me, to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look back. Uh, do not look behind you, excuse me, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, please know my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. 
but I cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape here, escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to them, see, I have favored you. Concern he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen and set upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heaven. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Amen. So at our first, over our, at first read, tonight. And of course, this is a story that many of us have heard before, but um, praying that we get new revelation tonight. Uh, at first read, what sticks out to you all about this set of verses? What sticks out? You have to leave. You have to leave, yes. Yeah. That's something. They were hesitant to leave. Mm hmm He was hesitant to leave. Anyone else? So a couple things stick out to me. First part was his son-in-laws didn't want to go. They thought that this was a joke. I'm like, mm, you like that kind of lifestyle, but okay. Um, that was the first thing that, um, and you know what? I don't, it's probably dawned on me before, but it was something about the way it came to me tonight that it really stuck out. And then um, um, Abraham, Asking God, you know, I can't go to the mountains. Can't you send me somewhere else? You know, somewhere else. I know you're getting ready to destroy that, but can I go over here to this little spot or something? He he wanted to still be kind of comfortable. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot. And yep. then the last thing um, that I'll say is... Um, Sarah, looking back, even after the Lord said, don't look back, keep look, keep on going, keep on going, don't look back. And she turned into a pillar of salt. And just as a side note, I'm, I'm seasoned, but I remember in the 60s, I don't even remember the name of the movie, but every year the movie came on about this. It may have been called Lot, I don't know. No, not Lot, Abraham and Sarah. But every year, faithfully around the same time in the 1960s, uh, there was a movie about this and it would come on every year. And I would just watch it in amazement at the end as Sarah turned into a pillar of salt. And I would be like, oh, God, I don't want to disobey you. I don't want to turn into a pillar of salt. I was a little girl then. Lord knows I thank God that he never turned me into a pillar of salt for all the times I didn't do what he told me to do. Amen. And just, we just want to uh, clarify. So you said it right, but then you flipped it. Abraham and Sarah versus Lot and his wife. So. Lot, oh, hey, oh yeah, yeah. Abraham. Yes. Yes. That's yes. What I meant Abraham. About, but we're talking about Lot and his wife. Amen. Anybody else? Um, Thank Elder you. Elder Cheney, what, well, there's a lot that sticks out, but at the very beginning, the first part that sticks out is that um, to me, everyone does not want to escape. Um, they, they were, um, Lot's son-in-laws were offered the opportunity to leave. But as we read, it just says Lot took his wife and two daughters. It does not say that the son-in-laws went. And so we have to understand that there are times when 
uh, you have a way to escape and everybody is not going to want to go and escape. And we have to realize and respect if they want to stay behind and, and die in their evil way and in their sin, there's nothing we can do about it. But they were offered, and it's just like us offering people the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they make a decision not to receive it. You offer, but you cannot make them take it and go. So that's what stood out with me with that part. Amen. Amen. Others? Anyone else? Elder Cheney, mm -hmm. I, I was concerned where, lot to me, though he had faith, it still was not 100%. Because not, not, not only was he hesitant and hoping at the last minute his daughters and them would come, I could understand that to a degree. But when the angel had did all these miracles and stuff, blinded the people the night before that were trying to attack them, when, when, when he said, this is what God says, go on out, go to the mountains. Now, if God is doing all this and he has already shown you provision in a sense and protection, would he not continue? But still he wanted to dictate where. He had not totally trusted and let go. Amen. So his wife did the total let go and not trust because she totally turned. He, he knew better to do that. Maybe he had enough discipline in him and all. But he still lacked. Amen. Thank you. Apostle? Um, yes. Uh, two things um, stuck out to me. Um, one, um, uh, in line with what um, Prophet Kern was saying, um, when I look at the story, um, we see clearly that everybody's not going to be saved. Um, so because the, the son-in-laws were there, <clears throat> and even what happened with Lot's wife, um, so it's even um, the, the close proximity um, that even though someone is even that close, it's still not a guarantee um, unless they, you know, follow and obey the things of the Lord. The second thing was for me with Lot, um, it showed that he followed the same pattern that got him there. Because when we know the story that he, um, when the contention arose between uh, him, his uh, herdsmen and Abraham's, and he was given a choice um, as to where to go in the land. <clears throat> and he chose Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and then turns around again, when there is a way offered to him, uh, he wants to make his own choice of where to go. So those are the two things that stuck out to me. Wow. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Those are all excellent, excellent points. Um, and some of some of what I, I had and wrote down, you all have already raised. But um, you know, we we don't know much. And I said at the beginning of this that Lot, the Lord reminded me of Lot's wife was sort of the impetus for me going down this whole path of Lot's situation in Genesis Genesis nineteen. Um, but we know, so we know a lot about Lot, but when we look back about um, and think about Lot's wife, the only things that we know about her is that she was his wife and she looked back. And so she was sort of made an example out of, but one of the things that stuck out to me was that the whole family had issues. There were a host of issues. She wasn't the only one, right? That was this, that she, as um, Mother Hartley said, Evangelist Hartley said, you know, she she blatantly disobeyed, right? The, the instruction was don't look behind you. And she did, but she also was among people. She wasn't a standout, you know, sort of person. She was among people who were also like the the nest or the, the sons-in-law who chose to stay. Um, and even Lot who hesitated you know, even before they 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 uh, took off, he lingered. And the angels, and the other thing that stuck out to me is that the angels had to literally lift him out of the situation. They had to take him by the hand and 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 pull them out of the situation. Him, his uh, his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters, because he was lingering. 
And so I just wonder how often we find ourselves in situations where we ling we linger, right? Like, okay, I, I just got to clean up a few more things. The Lord told you to go do something. It's like, I got to get a few more things together or I got to get these things together. I got to get my ducks in a row. I got to save up X amount of money. And he has to literally pull you out of the situation for it to happen, right? And so that was something that stood out to uh, me. But uh, what we know about Locke's wife, like I said, is that she is only known for being his wife and for looking back. If somebody could get me Luke 17, verses 32 through 33. Elder Cheney, while you were yes. um, speaking just now, a song, an old song came to mind and you were talking about how deep they were in sin and had to be pulled out. There was an old song that says, uh, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the, uh, what, from the waters he lifted me now safe down I. So all of us at one point, we were so deep in sin we didn't come out that easy. God had to literally pull us up out of where we were um, because that's just how deep sin is. And even though uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is, um, what should, what should I say? Uh, is is, is uh, on the way out there on the 100% scale of sin, of sin, if you want to call it that. The point of it is, is that all of them were in a place of sin. And the very fact that the Lord came to pull them out, that just tells us how much we were in sin also. And when it came down to get out, listen, we had to make some hard decisions when we heard that, heard the cry, you know, there was a battle within us when we were hearing the word to to accept Lord the Jesus as our Lord and Savior, because I rem I don't know about you all, but I think we talked about this once was that we heard the word, but then there was this mental battle that took place about going and accepting Jesus and accepting a new way of life versus staying in the life that that we've all had before, and so just like they had that battle, we had a battle coming to Christ, and we really had to be pulled up out of that sinful state and out of that sinful mindset. Amen. 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 And as you were speaking, uh, Prophet Karen, before we get to Luke, I want to ask the group, what does getting pulled out look like? What does that, what does that manifest itself as? Where in this case, the angels actually took them by the hand and pulled them out of their situation. What does getting pulled out look like when things have gotten to the point that if God doesn't do it, you know, I'm taking too long to get out this thing. And I don't understand what I, he told them that he was, the, the place was going to be destroyed, but we're still kind of dilly dallying around, right? What does getting pulled out look like? I'm just posing that question to the, to the group. And Elder Cheney, yes, it reminds me of, for as my self concern, how um, I remember before I even came to Christ. You know how we do, we pray in our heart. You know, God, I want to give my life to you. I want to do this, that, and that. But at the same time, um, I know God was pulling and tugging on me. But at the same time, I wasn't. I felt as though I wasn't ready, and I would say things like. I don't want to, I don't want to go to church yet because I'm a hit I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to do this because I don't want to do that. And I know sometimes I, I kind of just having this conversation with somebody a, a, a little earlier about how I wanted God to take me out of the situation, but at the same that that fight we talking about, fighting in the spirit about it, you know, same time. Cause I remember saying, because for me it was addiction. And I really I just wanted God to clean me up. I wasn't asking for all this other stuff. So I'm thinking that maybe you know sometime even in a, a situation like that we may want it partially but don't really want it i mean we do want it but we don't know how to deal with it so far as getting pulled out sometimes i think god has to push us even further for us to even get pulled out you know because it get to a point where we ain't got no other choice but god pulled me out and it, that's what it made me think about how 
I tried to straggle with the being pulled out when I know he was talking because I recall I can recall some years before I came in that God I really believe God was touching on my heart and because I was not willing to give up the things although I know I needed it I was not willing to give up some things that I thought was making me have a good life so I guess that's you know what pulling out look that look like for me right what we when, what we think is a good life go ahead Apostle. Right, exactly <laughs> Um, I was going to say, um, too, that um, I was thinking of one of the ways that um, being pulled out of a situation, what that looks like, is um, uh, there's something that God tells you to do, something you need to do, but um, you hesitate or you linger. Um, and at that point, there's like other opportunities. And what that can look like is um, God will close doors or God will shut down um, opportunities or other um, possibilities or other um, choices so that there is no choice <clears throat> except for what God is saying. So that to me uh, represents a type of God pulling you out of a situation because um, <clears throat> when all other opportunities are, 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 are closed, um, there is no other way. Um, I see that as a, a way of God pulling you out um, because sometimes we know that there's decisions that we need to make, but if there are other alternatives, sometimes because of what we want and it looks like those are like Lot when he was asking to go to another place because it looked as if it was a choice um, based on where he was, <clears throat> but God will close um, opportunities and, you know, shut down other choices. And um, so that that there is no other way but um, what God has said. And um, so I see that as a way uh, sometimes of what that looks like of God pulling us out of a situation. Um, and really it's saving us yeah. because sometimes we, we the, the Bible says, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end of that way is destruction. And sometimes we, because we could be so focused on what our desire is and what we want, <clears throat> we don't see the destruction. We just see the way. But God knows all of it. So God will sometimes in protecting us, um, he will shut down um, doors or close doors or, or um, um, dismiss uh, other opportunities and things that we're looking at so that there is only um, is following after what the Lord says. Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent points, everyone. And I also, you know, I'm reflecting, sitting here reflecting even on when I was a younger girl and um, even in college, and it was always perceived that I was like a goody two-shoe. And so when, if I was around somebody um, that was doing something they, wasn't, they weren't supposed to do, teachers, friends, the mind, people in general, just be like, you don't need to be around X, Y, and Z person, or you don't need to be around this. And when I got to college and I, and I um, got saved, I remember even going to parties and people be like, why are you here? And so God was using even people around me to be like, you don't need to be around uh, uh, people who are smoking. You know, we, we have a bunch of choices in college, right? And so Folks were smoking, folks were drinking, doing everything. And but it was almost as if they didn't want to be around me to do it because that that's just not you. That's just not you. And so for me, it was more, it was also like a mental switch where it's like, okay, Lord, well, I can't do any of things because because people won't let me anyways. If I, you know, I'm desiring these things as a, as a young girl trying to fit in, and people are looking at me like I'm crazy. Because this, this, the perception is that I'm a goodie. And, um, but the Lord, was, in hindsight, he was really protecting me because um, my decision-making capacity clearly needed some work at that time. And so he was, he was protecting me from, from uh, going down that path. But no, I totally agree with all the points that have already been made. Um, does anyone have Luke 17, 32 and 33? I have it. Okay. Go ahead. 
said, remember uh, Luke 17, 32 and 33. Oh, I'm says, sorry, thir 31 to 33, sorry. 31 to 33? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that day, <clears throat> which shall be upon the, wait a minute, excuse me. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Amen. And so we know and see that Lot's wife, no matter what good she may have done, is remembered for her disobedience. And, and, and the example is, if you try to save your life and follow Jesus, and if you're trying to save your life and retain your lifestyle and everything and follow Jesus, the two do not go together. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. And so we know that, um, and, and we, we, we talked briefly, I think Apostle talked about the, um, that Abram and Lot were traveling together. And this is back in Genesis 13. At some point, they could no longer dwell together. The land was not able to support them and their herdsmen began to fight one another. We know that Lot chose to go toward Sodom uh, it chose the plate of the plain, plain, excuse me, of Jordan, which was near Sodom to relocate to. It was well watered. It says in the Bible, like the garden of the Lord. This was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that Sodom and Gomorrah were known for their sin and their wickedness. Uh, in Genesis 14, and this is why I say, I really advise, um, you all to just go back and do a study of the, the, the few chapters that we're talking about. But in Genesis 14, War began in the region. Lot was living in Sodom. He was captured by Sodom's enemies a short time, short time after he arrived there. Um, Abram ends up rescuing him from being in captivity. And he goes back to Sodom. And a few chapters later in Genesis 18, Abram petitions when God says, I'm going down to Sodom to see what's going on myself. To see, you know, I know they, they, I know they over there acting crazy, but I'm going there myself, um, and I'm going to destroy it. Abram petitions, um, and by that time he's Abraham has already petitioned for the those that are righteous and living in Sodom, saying unto God, "Will you, will you destroy it if you find any righteous people in Sodom?" And God says, "I'll save it for for those that are righteous," but. We see that Lot is living in Sodom in Genesis 19. He's hosting the angels of the Lord leading up to the scriptures that we read in his home. And he's suddenly being instructed to pick up and leave after a group of men have come to the house and tried to have their way with the angels. Uh, to which Lot says, no, but you can have my daughter. So he's, he's still one of those situations where it's, he, he, was he was described as a righteous man, but he obviously had to, he was living in Sodom. And I also want to point out that um, in my research, this took place. All of this whole story took place over like the course of twenty years or something like that. And so, just to raise up the issue that there was, and I've said before in other messages that I've there's a settling that takes place. There's a steeping in the culture of some place that. Um, it's not like Lot just arrived there and this sequence of events took place. There was time that passed. There was an, a, 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 um, him growing accustomed to what was going on in Sodom, him navigating to what was going on in Sodom, his family members being steeped in the culture of Sodom. And so, um, which, you know, him hesitating, right, to leave Sodom, his sons-in-law saying, we, we, we think you're joking because why would, you know, we believe that anything bad is going to happen? We've been, you know, hanging out here for all this time is all part of that. It all took course over um, a, a period of time, be it a few years or, or however long. But there was a settling that took place that had um, steeped the sin and everything that was going on inside him into Lot and his family. And so... We focus a lot on Lot's wife, 
because she suffered the biggest consequence. We talked about that. But by the time we get to her, the whole family had underestimated the seriousness of God's instruction. Because we see that the sons-in-law thought he was joking. Lot dragged his feet. We talked about that already. And the Amplified version says that Lot hesitated and he lingered. Then he didn't want to go where the angel told him to go. Later on in Genesis 19, God's promise with Abraham is what held Lot up. Genesis 19 and 29. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that he overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. So the Lord's mercy and his promise with Abraham, right, that kept Lot from being destroyed along with, with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But the issues were within his whole family, not just his wife. And the example that came to me was around emergency evacuation. So we always hear stories about people who decided to stay when there was a hurricane coming, when the wildfires come in California and wherever else, and they decide to stay and say, you know what, my house is, or what hurricanes, my house is on stilts and are, you know, built high up. So the water is not going to get to me and the water consumes the entire house. We've seen, we've seen that happen where people decide to stay in their house in California and underestimate that the wildfire, despite warnings, is creeping up. And not even the fire is, is the, the main issue, but the smoke is coming. The smoke spreads you know, further than the fire goes, but they want to stay. They want to stay. And so they feel like they can't leave because all of their possessions right, are there. Everything they believe that they love that's important to them um, is there, but then they are later consumed. We hear stories about people passing away or choosing to stay home in those situations. So I want to ask the group, what do you all think made Lot's wife look back when the instruction was don't look back? And why do we look back? Dr. Cheney. When I'm when I when I think about Lot and his family and even his wife, they have a history. They do have a history with the Lord. Mm -hmm. They have a history of being delivered. Mm -hmm. They have a history of being set free. They have a history of God coming in, whether uh, through Abram and 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 being pulled out of things. And it reminds me of us even today. You know, if we have family members that they know we they know our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and and they know our prayers and you know pray for me and whatever and they get pulled out of something and then um they're okay for a while and then they go back to what they've been doing and then they look to us to pray them out again and so over this time frame as you're saying Lot and, and his family they have seen the hand of the Lord come in and save them. OK, so here now we've got another issue and the angel of the Lord is telling them. OK, we're going to we're going to pull you out, we're going to pull you out. And so the attitude is, OK, God's going to deliver us again. And it might not be all that bad because, you know, he's done this before. So <laughs> Lot's wife mindset could be that, you know, she's seen the Lord work before and um, they quote partially obeyed. <laughs> and been delivered before. So even if we partially obey right now, you know, nothing's really going to happen to, to us like that. You know, you, you kind of take the God's uh, grace, you take his long yeah. suffering, you take his deliverance for granted and mm -hmm. think, oh, well, we got away this time. We got away last time. We got away with this. Oh yeah. They're always saying this is going to happen, but he spared us. And so this time, yeah, you were delivered, but your partial disobedience, you now see the results of your partial disobedience because one person died. And that even happens with the hurricane sometimes and and in and, and bad weather and fires and stuff where, okay, well, we made it out last time, we made it out this time, we made it out. And so we we gamble. That's what I thought. We gamble again, and then something happens and maybe one person, it may not be the whole family, but just one death yep. came and it's like a wake up call. So 
that's the way I see it is a cycle of being delivered and having a mindset of, oh, it's not all that serious, but God will deliver us because of Abraham. God will deliver us because my mom's the pastor. God will deliver us because, you know, I know apostle them and, you know, I'm close to them. They keep me covered in the blood or whatever. And so we go out and they do these things knowing that uh, we, we, you know, the prayers of the righteous and the prayers of the saints have pulled them out before and they go back and do it, a partial mindset. Amen. Amen. Apostle, thank you. I was going to say that I, I think a lot of times that um, like what happened with Lot, Lot and um, his wife, um, you kind of get satisfied or content where you are. And I think they were just content there. They were, they were satisfied. They, even though you see the things that's going on around you, you get kind of content. In, in those situations. And I, I, I can say like you, for us, um, for me personally, it's like when, when change would come sometimes, I couldn't understand why the change had to come at that time if nothing was wrong, I thought. Mm -hmm. And you, you know things are wrong, yeah. but when the challenge comes to make the move, it's like, well, it's not that bad. And you know, I can, I can figure something else out, but you, you, this is what you've been asking for and what you've been really praying about. So I think once the change comes is why we sometimes look back because that change is going to require a little more than what we thought it was going to, um, in order for us to really get what it is. Um, if we could have just got it where we were, you know, I just think about when it, when the Lord had um, had prompted us to leave from the church where we were. I, I, I said to Pastor, "Why well, we everything's fine? I mean, what happened? <laughs> what what happened? You know, when when did something change? I knew what the Lord had been saying, and then when we started talking about it, it became a reality to me." Yeah. But when I talked to him, he was, you know, and he was like, we, he was going and pray about it. But once we got out, I was like, oh my God, this is hard. Mm. This is harder than I thought. Why, why does it have to be so hard? Because the trials and the tribulations that came with that decision was not what I factored in or thought it would be. So her looking back, um, didn't realize how much was still in her heart. Yeah. Looking back. Amen. Apostle, was your hand raised? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I actually saw a couple of things. I wanted to, uh, well, I want to go back to something earlier when we talk about, um, about Lot and his wife. Uh, <clears throat> because I, I actually see a principle. Um, I, I actually see a principle um in in terms of obeying god that that when you obey god <clears throat> that you have to be focused on the instruction um simply because things are not what they appear to be and lot chose sodom and gomorrah because it was pleasurable what it, it, he saw you know the state that what it appeared to be um but abraham <clears throat> on the other hand um the the journey that he took um was it didn't seem pleasurable to the sight, but it was the will of God, and and um, and Abraham uh, really knew understood that he was a sojourner, and so I think the principle uh, I wanted to just point out that a principle in obeying God is you can't go by how something looks. You have to stay focused on the word of the Lord. Um, the same way Isaac, God sent Isaac to uh, down to Egypt. Uh, I'm not I told him not to go to Egypt, or rather. Um, but it, the place that God sent them, it was a famine. And it would look like definitely not the choice, um, but it was the instruction of the Lord, so victory was there. So that's the point I wanted to bring out. I saw a principle in this in obeying the Lord that we can't go by what we see, that we have to stay focused on the instruction. The other thing is that we have to learn to wear things loosely in this life. Um, <clears throat> because I... I, I um, with with Lot and uh, his wife and family choosing Sodom and Gomorrah, um, there was a a song in the world. I don't I don't know the name of the song. I don't remember 
all the words. Only thing I remember is two. No, it was a it was a a, a gospel group. Uh, I think uh, Crown somebody Crown, and the name of the song was called Slow Fade. And basically, what the song was implying was that that you could be exposed to something that so long until you are you are really not aware of how much you're being impacted and affected by it. Mm. And I believe that with Lot and his wife, that they were in there while they knew the lifestyle and everything in Sodom and Gomorrah was against the righteousness of God. But because they were not intentional about their lifestyle, they walked with God, it was kind of like a slow fade. They, they actually became more engulfed by that um, Sodom and Gomorrah than what they realized. And I, I would I would say, you know, just um, just in thinking that when they were pulled out, that 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 was a moment that Lot's wife had where she felt that impact of that influence. Um, and and to her, it seemed that she was walking away. What she was walking away from was more what she desired than what she was going to. And so her looking back showed com um, completely how much uh, she had been captivated by uh, what was in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's what I wanted to point out. Number one, the principle that we can't always go by what we see um, because things are not as they appear on the outside. And then the other thing is sometimes we can be in situations we know that it's not and, and we have to learn in this life to wear things loosely and not get attached to things <clears throat> so that in the time when God instructs us to do something, we do not allow ourselves to be in that position where we end up looking back because we become so attached to things that, that um, you know, and we that we won't we're not able to. Um, um, to walk away from it. And one more point, even when Abraham had to offer his son up, because hmm. God was testing where Abraham's um, faith and obedience and alliance was, even though that was God's promise to him. So Abraham had to prove that he loved God more when he was told to offer up his son. Hmm. Amen. Amen. And uh, I found the song, Apostle, just even while you were just talking, um, Casting Crowns is the group. Casting Crowns is the group. And yes, the song is Slow Fade. And even as you were talking, that also reminded me, and I believe Mother Hartley, you had your hand up, but that reminded me of um, Jonathan McReynolds has a song called No Gray, where he talks about um, being torn in two. Part of me loves the world, the other loves you. And just saying that, you know, if it's God that I'm after, I can't serve two masters. And I think a lot of times, going back to even Prophet Karen's point, is that we gamble and think that we're even testing God. It's like, I'm holding on to this little sliver of grace until it, till the wheels fall off. And that's how I'm going to make it. <laughs> how I'm going to make it to heaven. And somebody gets hurt. It's either us or the people around us. It's, it's bound to happen. And I think that... Um, I agree. I think that Lot's wife fell into that um, uh, that heart issue, where it's like you know everything behind us. She, brought, I mean, friends. We, you're just telling me that our family has to leave. Me and my daughters got to go, and my husband, and 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 I have to leave behind the people that I've gotten to know and like and everything, and and uh, the lifestyle that we've gotten accustomed to and everything, and you know, looking back is what got her killed. And she became an example, not only for her family, but for all of us, um, is what can happen when you directly disobey and you, you test, God, test God, quote unquote, for the last time. Because the direction was very specific. Do not look behind you. Evangelist Hartley, did you have um, a comment? Yes, ma'am, agreeing with everything everybody has said. Um, when we go into a wilderness of change, and that's what the words came to me, change for us is a wilderness full of challenges, good or bad, but they're still full of challenges. Um, the, the Bible says where your heart, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Her treasure was what probably I was thinking she left her grandchildren. She left her daughters. I don't know how many children she had in there because it doesn't really say. 
and and then she left, like you're saying, the lifestyle. They left all their possessions. They, Lot was a rich man, I think, and he had cattle and all kinds of stuff. They left all of that to start bare. And you know, us women say, look, I'm tired of going through this. How many times we got to move and go through this kind of stuff? And her heart wasn't there. It was back there. That's all. And oh, to, to, to bring this home, God told me to move from the last, from my house, which I had been in since I was 12 years old, off and on. And I waited over a year or more. You know what made me move? Getting robbed, getting burglarized from my house twice. And the third time, the people, when they burglar, tried to burglarize, I was home. That's the only reason to stop. Then I said, okay, <laughs> I need to move. That's how hard hearted, how hard headed. Uh, you know, because you hold, I, there's so many memories, but God can give you new memories. That's the part we forget. Yep. Amen. Um, um, Sister Karen, your hand is up. Yeah. Um, I was thinking also that, you know, when you're, when you have to, um, move and, and you're looking, mm, when you have, when you have to move and you look back and you think you're leaving things that means so much to you behind. And the sad part about her looking back is that she's still standing there today. You know, she is still standing in that same position today as, as far as I know, if a bomb haven't knocked her down, you know, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, she's still standing there today. And I think about me, if I had a state where God was telling me to move from um, in my sinful state, where would I have been? You know, I don't think I would have seen my children and my children's children today because of the diagnosis that was given to me. And if I had to follow suit along with um the medications that were being, you know, offered to you, um, I don't know where I would be, you know, and that could be my testimony. There she is today, you know, because of her hard headness, you know, because my grandmother used to always say I had a very hard head, you know, and so, but it, nevertheless, it wasn't that I was so much hard headed. I just challenged things, you know, and I still do it to this day, even though I'm older and a little bit more wiser. Some things I'll challenge and some things I'll just say, you know, never mind. I just, uh, I'd rather obey God and be happy. So, yeah. Amen. And Go ahead, Prophet Dr. Karen. Dr. Cheney, I was laughing. Do you all remember the saying, curiosity killed the cat? That just came to mind. Lot's wife was curious. Mm -hmm. She was meddling in God's business. <laughs> and curiosity killed her. She was curious to see. That's That was another thing. We talked about her heart. And maybe she was looking back. But she was also curious to yeah. see it for herself. Yeah. Curiosity can cause you to be frozen in place. Curiosity can cause you to, to go into sin. Uh, you think about a lot of people who God tells you, uh, don't, 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 don't take that drug, but you take it anyway. Curiosity got you cooked on it. Curiosity got, you know what I'm saying? So that was another thing may have been going through Lot's wife mindset was curiosity looking at God's business and she wasn't supposed to be looking at God's business but yeah. going forward that that just came to me. amen amen and both prophet Karen and sister Karen raised points that I'm going to end on but I was thinking even as you were talking about curiosity is that there are things that God does not want us exposed to right there are things that he says you don't even worry I got I'm coming and destroy this place. You don't need to see it. So keep it moving. And so there, like you said, she turned around, she was curious 
And as uh, Sister Karen said, she's still there right now. And I just thought that it was interesting because I want to just end on this point that it was interesting that the word pillar was used to say that she turned into a pillar of salt because a pillar is almost like a monument of sorts. She didn't turn into like just a mound of salt she did, or a pile, but a pillar is almost like, if you think about a pillar in a positive light, a pillar of the community or a pillar is like a monument of sorts that people can go and, re and look at and, and reflect on. And so she literally got stuck there. And so what happens when we look back and when we desire to go back to places is that we get stuck and it's counterproductive to the instruction that the Lord gave us because we'll never reach the next place that we're supposed to go if we're desiring to go back to where we came from, the place that God told us to leave. And so um, I'm just gonna wrap up there and we'll pick up where, where we left off, but I really enjoyed this discussion tonight and I pray that um, you all have uh, received something um, uh, tonight. Um, and I will turn the class back over to our apostle. Amen. Praise God. Can we give God praise for the class tonight? Amen. Great class. And for Ella Cheney, um, great class and um, great discussion. Uh, thank you to everybody that participated. Um, it is definitely uh, something to always um, uh, to be mindful of in this walk with the Lord that uh, we have to wear this life loosely, um, that we cannot allow uh, the Bible says our hearts to become overcharged or overwhelmed um, with the cares and the concerns of this life. Um, and we know looking back and, and Elder Cheney just mentioned it when she said about desire is not only just an action of the eyes, but the action of the eyes was a response to the, the posture of the heart, um, the condition of the heart. And so um uh we have to make sure that when whenever the instruction comes uh we have to move with the lord um, um and that's even in a good sense um even as believers and we we know that god uh, does wonders and god does um great things in our lives um just like he did with peter uh, when peter uh up on the mount of transfiguration and when peter saw jesus in his glory um, and that was a good thing, uh, but Peter um, mishandled it because he wanted to build a monument, but that was never the instruction of the Lord. And God told, uh, Jesus told Peter that we had to go down from here. There's still work yet to be done. And so we have to be careful not to build monuments and stay stuck in a place while it's a good thing as well. Uh, we can't stay stuck there. And uh, I was thinking of the story in my last point in Haggai. Um, God tells them when they're building the temple, he says, he asks them a question. He says, who among you was left that saw this house um, in its first glory? And he said, how do you see it now? And I believe that was a question that he was asking them because it was um, not that God didn't know, but God wanted them to locate their heart, their desire where they were. And uh, because they were, they were those who had seen the, uh, the, 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 the house in its former glory, first glory, they, uh, they were crying. When they saw what it looked like now, <clears throat> they were crying. And, um, and the sad commentary was they were crying over a former state, even though God had prophesied to them and said, listen, no matter how great you think the, la uh, the former was, he said, the glory of this latter house, don't go by how it looks, go by what I'm saying, this glory of the latter house, what you're looking at now is not, is not what was in former days, but it's going to be greater than it was then. <clears throat> and, um, and so there's a prophetic word. That's why the Bible said he takes us from faith to faith. No matter what signs, wonders, and miracles God do in your life, don't stay there. Keep moving with the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, so great class tonight. Great class. Thank you again, uh, Elder Cheney. Thank you to everybody that joined tonight um, as we get ready to take our lead. Um, may the grace of God. Yes. Before we close out. Yes. Um, this is not anything scriptural. This is just a FYI for everyone. If you live in Baltimore County, I know the city has already implemented it, but beginning November the 1st, 
bring your own bag legislation goes into effect, which means that when you go to the market, if you don't have your own bag, you're going to have to pay for your paper bag or reusable bag. So if you don't want to be paying for bags, get your bag because in Baltimore County, you will have to have your own bag or you're going to have to pay for it. So that's starting November the 1st. That, that begins November the 1st. So that's an uh, save your money, get your reusable bag and just keep it in your car because you will need it in Baltimore County beginning November the 1st. Amen. Lord to God. Thank you, Prophet Karn. Yep. So let's um, remember that. Um, I know for me, because I'm just used to going to the store and, and have them bag up my stuff with a bag they have there. So um, just have to, have to make that adjustment. So thank you so much for that. Amen. So may the Lord bless and keep you. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest, rule, and abide with us one and all and the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost. Until we see each other again, uh, have a great night. God bless you.